just clarify for me. Yeah, because I don't want to tread on things. No, 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 no. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if we can take our seats. Okay, first of all, good morning. Welcome to the second session of the day and our first breakout finished vehicle logistics uh, session. Just a quick reminder, this is, again, one of the, one of the sessions that's being streamed live uh, as we speak to our global audience. There's the, you saw the login instructions, uh, and they're also in the program. So feel free to use that if you'd like to make any comments or, or questions uh, rather than raising your hand. Although, as Louis mentioned in the first session, our preference is in terms of answering questions uh, for those who are present in, in the room. Uh, my name is Christopher Ludwig. I'm the editor of the Automotive Logistics Group. And uh, thank you again very much for, for joining us again in Bonn and for coming to join us here to discuss finished vehicle logistics, serving the customer. Okay, serving the customer is the most fundamental thing about this or any industry. Uh, whether your customer is an OEM, a port, a dealership, or the car buyer uh, herself. And indeed, we have a panel here that, that represents quite, quite a range of interests, operations, and business areas serving various customers, uh, including an industry standards association with Odette. We have the Association of European Vehicle Logistics and ECG, uh, a damage claim specialist with Cevitas, and an IT software provider, uh, Sovereign. So you know, I think there's, there's a lot of, lot of room to discuss. What brings them all together in a way, I suppose, is the, the complexities of, of serving customers in outbound logistics right across the supply chain. Uh, in particular, this is an industry that needs good communication systems and processes that help track and optimize vehicle movements, record delivery or register damage incidents and claims. But there's also a need for those systems to communicate across a disparate set of uh, of players uh, that use various equipment and servers and processes. Um, so luckily we have groups like Odette and ECG to, to help us integrate things like that. Uh, we'll have a few short presentations uh, and, then, and then I think we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A. Um, and I think there's no sort, shortage of things we, we can discuss, uh, whether it's EDI protocols or paperless delivery and invoicing. And also Part of serving the customers, of course, looking ahead. And uh, as we heard from the first session, uh, there's a couple of important trends coming our way, which we might want to keep in mind as well, which uh, whether it's SICA emission control zones in, in Northern Europe or truck loading standards, there's, there's a host of things. Um, so I'll just introduce our panel. We'll start, we'll have a presentation from Mike Sturgeon, the executive director of ECG. Then we'll also hear from John Canvin, the managing director of Odette. Uh, we'll have some slides from Matt Holmes, the director of Cevitas, and then joining the panel for the Q&A is Richard Barker, CEO of Sovereign Business Integration. Funnily enough, it's an all-British panel, so um, for those who weren't wor worrying that, the, that Britain's about to crash out of the EU, at least it's not reflected here in our panel. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mike Sturgeon. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Am I working? Yes. Um, first of all, I apologise for croaking. So uh, hopefully, my voice will uh, will last for uh, a few slides. So, uh, uh, and actually, I think I'm almost Belgian now, Chris. So, uh, um, so serving the customer. I'm, I'm actually. Uh, this is a rather tenuous link. I'm not quite sure how I make it. And in fact, this doesn't seem to be working. Do we have a technical problem? Ah, right. Uh, I'm going to leap from serving the customer to collaboration, which is uh, uh, something I was asked to speak about this morning. Uh, so I've got a, a few slides just to talk about some of the things that we are uh, have been doing or are looking at doing in the future. And uh, uh, what do we mean by that? It's, it's, I think it's an overused word in our industry, so uh, I just wanted to start by defining it because it, I think it means different things to different people. And while, uh, while the dictionary might say it's the act of working with someone to produce something or to work together, especially in a joint intellectual effort, um, all very well, but for me it's about sharing the burden, it's about doing more with less, uh, working more efficiently. Uh, so what have we been doing with that? Well, we've, ECG is four and a half people. Uh, one of them is me, so there's, there's three and a half others in our, our offices in Brussels. Um, 
and uh, there is always more to do than we have the resources to do it with. So we have very good reason to, to collaborate and work with other people to, uh, to be as efficient as possible. And on top of that, uh, our members, the industry as a whole, is leaner than ever before. And we, clearly, we all have to be as efficient as possible. So who can we, as, as ECG, who can we collaborate with? Well, anyone with a common interest uh, or a shared problem, if we can see that there's a, a perceived benefit or potential to deliver uh, a benefit for the industry. Well, there are some obvious opportunities exist. Uh, AIAG, who I will talk about in a, in a second, who are the closest thing we have to uh, an opposite number in uh, the North American market. Uh, Odette, John Cavan's going to be talking in a minute. We, uh, we clearly have quite a lot of common ground. Uh, other associations, AML, the German National Association, for example, the scope as well there for, uh, for collaboration. So, and that's just uh, the most obvious. Uh, but I, I do want to talk in particular today about what we're doing with, uh, with a AIAG. Uh, it's the Automotive Industry Action Group. Uh, you may or may not be aware of them. Uh, we have a representative from AIAG here today. Bill, I can see you at the back there, I think. Yes, do you want to just stand up and uh, make yourself visible? So Bill's come over and joined us uh, for a couple of days from, uh, from the States. Very pleased to see him, and, uh, and we're going to be spending some time picking his brains in, uh, in Brussels at the end of the week as, uh, as well. So uh, uh, what do they do? Well, uh, they actually grew from representing the inbound side of the business. Uh, relatively new to outbound, in, uh, certainly in our terms. ECG is 18 years old this year, so uh, um, uh, we've been going a little bit longer in, uh, than them on the outbound side. They've got a vast membership, and one big difference that AIAG has in their market, the OEMs are members as well, and everybody sits at the same table, uh, which can certainly make having conversations much easier, I guess. So... Uh, um, what have we done together? Well, historically, uh, maybe you've seen what we've called uh, here in Europe the Global Damage Codes Project. This is something that uh, came from AIAG. Um, they call it, or it's included in, a, in their uh, finished vehicle transportation uh, damage standards and, and guidelines. Uh, the idea behind this was to get everybody using a standard set of codes to identify damage. Uh, I don't have to tell you that uh, there's a wide variety of different uh, sets of uh, codes out there uh, today. So there's an obvious logic to try to achieve this. We've, there are even OEMs who use different codes in different parts of the world. Um, so this is clearly an area right for standardization. We haven't done uh, uh, a lot with it in, in Europe over the last uh, couple of years, but uh, that's certainly on the agenda to, uh, uh, to see how we can uh, further support that. It's very much a long-term project, though. In the last few months, um, AIAG said, oh, we like your uh, operations quality manual. Uh, Bill said, oh, we need to develop something like that over here. So uh, we've, uh, in, in some ways, supported them in, in doing that. And they've been developing uh, their quality handling manual uh, over there, which I think is now, you, you're finished on that, Bill. Uh, and one of the things that we've looked at doing with that is, as I'll mention in a moment, is, is maybe then taking that wider still. What else are they working on? Well, uh, EPOD, um, not, not something that is unique to uh, one particular market. AIAG have already progressed this to a draft uh, proposal stage. Um, so we're going to be talking uh, more about that this week. You know, the the prin basic principle cannot be any different between... Uh, between major markets. So there must be scope there to, uh, to collaborate on that. Some of the other things that we're, uh, we're talking about looking at together, forecasting and planning quality and processes. Um, again, I don't need to tell any of you how important that is to all of us. Uh, potentially port quality and audit standards. Um, standardizing of storage requirements, whether it's keys, gears, handbrakes, whatever. Uh, again, different by OEM, different by market quite often. Uh, and indeed, sometimes different between different production plants uh, for the same, uh, same brands. And one of the things that... Uh, oh, I want... Thank you. Uh, one of the things that... Uh, 
I was asked to look at when I first joined ECG four years ago was uh, whether we had um, some scope to look at things on a wider scale because we're handling global products. Um, we know AIAG, we know there are other associations, mostly very new ones in other parts of the world. We see, uh, for example, that our, the ECG operations quality manual is downloaded across the world. We see it being downloaded in Asia, in Australia, in India, in China. Um, so it's clear that, excuse me, <clears throat> it's clear there are people out there who are choosing not to reinvent the wheel, but simply to take advantage of uh, work that's already been done. So one of the things that we, uh, we want to look at is whether there's a benefit to, to all of us in some sort of global association of associations, albeit on a very loose basis, uh, and whether we can promote standardization on a wider level. Uh, so that was, uh, that was all I wanted to say. Thank you. My voice has just about held out. So, uh, Chris. Okay, Mike, thanks a lot for that, that overview and, and for kicking us off. Uh, impressive what the ECG can do with four and a half people. I'm not sure which half of that, of that individual you have. I'm hoping it's the top one. You can get a bit more out of them that way. Um, next up, uh, from Odette, we have John Canvin on this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be back again and good for, to have the invitation again to come and speak to, to all of you and to catch up with new old friends and new friends. For ODET, uh, for those of you who don't know, is an organization funded by the European motor industry and uh, actually this year is going to be our 30th year, um, so a little bit longer than, than, uh, than Mike, but uh, I have to say that Mike and I have had a lot of contacts over recent years and his organization is pretty much the same size as ours. Uh, it uh, makes, makes some challenges, but it's all good fun. And hopefully we are able to do something for the industry, as we've shown over the last 30 years. And a lot of the focus has been on the uh, inbound side of things, uh, but we have been looking more closely at the outbound side. And that's the, the context in which I want to bring you this, uh, this short presentation. New vehicle distribution, B2B data exchanges, Standardization opportunities. Mike was already talking about standardization. It's something which just comes up time and time again. Uh, collaboration, benefits of collaborating. Everybody says it, but not many people manage to find the time to do it. But let's, let's have a look and see what we've tried to do. Um, we, about a year ago, uh, were asked by one of the large manufacturers to look into this. They got spending so much time on setting up new transport companies and operations uh, in different parts of, of Europe and different parts of the world. They said, everybody's doing things differently. Why don't we try and make some standards? So they came to us and said, Let's, surely we could, we could do something together. And, and that's what we've tried to do over this last year. In fact, I mentioned it at the meeting here a year ago. Um, what, we, um, what I wanted to talk about is what the... Uh, the basic, the uh, current situation is. And the objectives of, of this project was to uh, develop a description of the common processes in the car distribution market and to develop standardized messages, B2B messages for communicating instructions and reports. Um, and here uh, it's felt not only the manufacturer who came to me, but other manufacturers and certainly service providers would benefit from the availability of some standardized interface. Well, the current situation is that no international standards exist. Much time is wasted setting up suppliers and transport companies. Solutions are often proprietary to an OEM, as, as, we, as we see and as you know. Uh, service activities may be necessary also at, uh, at various compounds uh, and, and ports which have to be ordered, conducted and then reported back. Transport service providers have to communicate the status of the various uh, processes regularly, uh, often includes multimodal transport of course uh, and over, over very long distances as well um, as, as we know. So that's the, that's the sort of scale of the project. And uh, the solution could be here to identify and describe common patterns and activities in the, the processes 
uh, and the requirements for the information exchange between the vehicle manufacturers and the service providers. Uh, we would model all the key processes and the elements, uh, produce simple B2B messages that would exchange the information that's required to be exchanged uh, in either an fact or an XML format and, and build in a high level of system integration. Well, it all sounds pretty good. Um, the challenge is actually making it happen. Uh, the benefits could, could be a, a number here and uh, just, just some of the examples. Automated exchange of information between all the partners involved, reducing the running costs for existing IT systems, better choice and more easy onboarding of, of new service providers, which is, as I've talked around the industry, it can take sometimes months to achieve. Better visibility of stock and over longer distances uh, and improved end customer information. Even talking to the dealers where, where information on deliveries is inaccurate at the last minute, the customer is looking forward to taking delivery of his car. At the end of the, end of the week, at the weekend, he's got his plans for the weekend to take the family out and he gets a call from the dealer saying, sorry, uh, the, the, the transport has been delayed. I'm, I'm afraid we can't uh, give you your car for the weekend. So customer satisfaction all the way down through the chain could be improved. So what we did was uh, we've talked to all of the vehicle manufacturers in Europe and everybody said, yes, that's a good idea. It, it, it could be certainly worth doing and, and looking into. And as a result of that, we had a meeting in Berlin with some of the manufacturers and we agreed that we would carry out a survey just to sort of try to get a, a handle on what is the picture out there today, what sort of information is being exchanged, how is it being exchanged, what protocols are being used and so on. Unfortunately, um, the result uh, has been a little slow in coming forward. We've had five manufacturers who've replied and we're very, very grateful for that and they came with information which was, which was very interesting for us. It doesn't give us a total picture for the European motor industry, unfortunately, but it does give us some information and it does show some of the complexities that are there. Now, having talked to a lot of logistics service providers, port handlers, compound operators, ECG members, uh, on the other hand, the people who are really affected by a lot of this at the other side of the coin, there's been a, a very strong support for this. And one of the quotes I, I put here is from uh, an LSP I spoke to. Sometimes we have to spend several months getting the IT systems to work with a new customer that we resort to paper in order to start the, the contract on time. And that's crazy. Uh, an awful lot of work is going in, a lot of work has been uh, expended, money's been spent, and still they can't manage to get it done because of the complexity of each of the customer systems. So our survey that we carried out, we, we had a, an online survey which we put together. We, we listed on the left-hand side there on the green column all of the more obvious types of information that could be shared uh, and is exchanged between all the different parties, partners um, and, and the formats in which they're used. And you can see there we've got uh, a number there. Um, this is not a complete list by any means. Uh, and then you've got the various different formats, of course, which are having to be handled as well. Uh, again, by the, the end users, the transport companies, the compound handlers. Uh, so each one of those has got to be handled and somehow integrated. Um, and comments I was getting is, well, we can't probably go on to one, but why can't we just reduce that number down a little bit? So that was the, the picture. Um, the meaning, unfortunately, the, the numbers at this point in time are not so relevant because of the, uh, only the, the five that have responded so far. But we, we asked again, what would you prefer as a format for exchanging, for example? Um, and we, the preference here was for XML and Edifact. Um, we asked what methods of communications are used. How do you exchange that data? Uh, file transfer protocols, secure file transfer protocols, um, the ODET file transfer protocol, OFTP, OFTP2, uh, value-added networks like GXS, uh, DNet and so on, uh, VPNs, ENX, uh, HTTP or HTTPS. 
So that's a sort of spread again of the different uh, communication methods. Um, we th ask the question, what would you prefer? Um, um, happily here, but again, not so significant in the number of results that we've got, but happily from the ODET point of view, we've got the ODET file, trans file transfer protocol, uh, which is, uh, would be a preferred way of, of transferring the data. And that we could, we, uh, the file transfer protocol that we have today is highly secure at each end with, with digital certificates. But uh, as it happened, that, that would be a preference, but again, that's something which we would look into in the future. So what can we conclude so far? Well, it's best summed up by one company who was dealing with different OEMs, with rail and road transporters and, and shipping lines. They said many different protocols take time to set up, and there are so many of them. The format for the information is different with each customer, and we have to handle nearly 20 types of messages. And all of that needs integration. It needs all of the usual um, readers and, and, and processors to make sure that it can work and they can communicate with their customers. But today, sadly, we don't have enough results uh, to form a clear picture. But if, if for example, and, I, and it's very much off the top of our heads, but if we could just save two euros a car, and that's a car shipped from Europe, for example, that doesn't include the vehicles that are coming into Europe from, from outside, but just say the 15 million approximately cars that may be shipped from Europe to other parts of Europe or out, outside of Europe, that will represent a saving of 30 million euros. That's not a, an insignificant sum. And that two, two euros may be just a, a complete underestimate, but uh, uh, we, we don't really know at this stage because we haven't got so much information so far. So, in, in summary, Odette will leave the door open for collaboration. And... Uh, I thank you very much. That's, uh, that's the picture as we have today. So, Christopher, thank you. <clears throat> okay, John, thank you very much for updating on, us on that. Again, quite an important issue. It might seem small in a way, but then you see the figures, 30 million euro potential. Um, and it sounds like John needs some more feedback from the survey to really to really get an idea of, of, of what we need. So OEMs and providers, you know, get in touch with John to, to give that feedback. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Matt Holmes from Cevitas. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, for those who uh, don't know who I am, uh, I'm Matt, um, Holmes Director of Cevitas. Uh, we're a claims agent, risk management company, vehicle inspection company, uh, working purely in fu uh, finished vehicle logistics. Uh, we have um, operations based in the UK, but also have um, operations in, uh, in Holland, uh, in Germany, and in Russia. Uh, this morning, I will be, the mouse works, uh, talking a little bit about um, who the customer is, um, defining uh, what a quality service um, could look like for finished vehicle logistics, um, and how um, collaboratively, again, using the word uh, collaboration, um, how we can all um, work together to, um, to meet their customers' uh, needs and requirements. So, starting with the, uh, with the customer. Um, very obvious to everybody in the room that we all have customers. Um, some of those customers um, are different. If you work for a manufacturer, you may consider that the dealership um, is the customer. If you work for a logistics company, you may think that the OEM is your customer, and obviously we have suppliers for the LSPs also uh, represented in the room. Uh, most uh, of our customers all um, value service based on um, time, quality, and cost. Um, those um, requirements are um, not always um, compatible, not always complementary. Um, so um, it's quite possible when you're talking about finished vehicle logistics um, to talk about getting a vehicle somewhere on time. Well, you could do that by putting it with premium air freight, the vehicle would get there quicker, but it wouldn't be very compatible with the idea of getting there as, as cheaply as possible. Equally, you could strap the car to, a, to the back of a rocket and it would, uh, it would get it there quickly, but you wouldn't really uh, want to, uh, to consider the, con the condition of the vehicle when it got there. But for all of us, I think the prime motivator has got to be the person who's buying the car, who, as John um, correctly said, um, is um, very influenced by um, something going wrong in the logistics flow. 
um, particularly as it relates um, to, um, to vehicle damage. So, defining uh, quality service. Um, what does our customer want? Well, again, as John said, they want the vehicle to arrive on time and in perfect condition. Uh, with no uh, delays um, relating to the repair of the vehicle uh, en route um, or once the vehicle arrives at the dealership um, waiting for the car to be fixed uh, in order to be here uh, to be sold on. Um, the number of um, sold units across our industry is um, increasing markedly. Um, the number of um, units built to order also increasing. So the days are long gone where somebody would go to a dealership and say well yeah, I'd like a red one or I'd like a black one please. Um, they're actually buying highly customised, highly modified vehicles for themselves um, and it very, very, therefore very, very important that that vehicle is the one that turns up on time because there isn't really a plan B. Um, everybody else um, is looking for the vehicle to arrive at lowest cost, of course. Um, claims and damages uh, lead to um, administration charges, not least our own. Um, additional freight charges to move the vehicles around to get them uh, repaired if the vehicles are being repaired en route insurance costs, uh, and so on. Um, I think it's also very important to, um, to point out to people that um, when a vehicle uh, arrives in a dealership with damage, um, we, we could be adding maybe um, five or ten days um, to the repair, uh, to the um, delivery process. Um, the speed to get the vehicle authorised, once the vehicle arrives with damage, we, we send the estimate to a, to a carrier and we say, oh, can you please have a look at the claim for us, um, validate the claim costs, so on. That could be easily adding three or four days before you even start the repair. So um, it's very easy for a dealership um, with a damaged vehicle to break the customer's, um, to make, break, break the customer's promise uh, and, uh, and fail to deliver to um, expectations. But of course, damages occur. Um, poor handling, um, at the end of the day, is people moving cars and you can't always uh, legislate for people. Uh, it can be poor processes that cause damage, um, poor systems, poor training, uh, poor equipment, not necessarily in Europe, um, but um, some of the markets that we're dealing with, um, equipment and uh, faulty equipment or uh, not, not um, fit for purpose equipment uh, can be a big issue. And, um, and as I'll talk about in a little, in a little while, um, bad luck. You know, sometimes just things happen and, uh, and you can put the best laid plans and, and things will go wrong. And it's then how you respond um, to those issues when they happen. So how can we meet customer needs? Well, for us, uh, I'm afraid, no uh, one magic bullet to solve, um, to solve problems. Uh, loss prevention activity is how we um, advocate um, improving quality in the finished vehicle logistics sector. So for us, uh, loss prevention is a focus on reducing damage, so stopping the damages from occurring, um, helping people reduce liability, um, the inefficiencies associated with managing damage. It's about proactive damage reduction activity which is based really on um, good data analysis and management of the data um, from uh, across the whole of the logistics chain, across the whole of um, the whole of the, co the continent. It's about um, once you've identified a problem, basic problem solving um, and focusing on what's achievable. Um, there's a very little point in, uh, in, in, in undertaking some projects where you know um, it's impossible um, to get a return. So you focus on the things that you think, actually, I can make a difference here. Uh, I can help the, uh, the logistics companies or I can help the manufacturers uh, reduce the damage by focusing on, uh, on the stuff that we can actually uh, achieve. Um, for us, there are, there are four uh, main parts, but to, but to spare you, um, uh, I'll focus purely on um, the logistics quality auditing and cat loss um, planning. But just to touch on vehicle handling standards, uh, Mike uh, made the point earlier on that um, the ECG um, put a lot of effort in a um, couple of years ago to launch um, vehicle handling standards for, for, um, for vehicle handling in Europe, which for us was great because um, I think it's surprising for us as a claims agent and as a vehicle inspection company um, how um, many OEMs don't have their own um, fixed standards in terms of how they want their logistics companies to move their cars uh, and what their processes should be. Uh, low trials, um, again, not, not necessarily so much in Europe, um, but particularly um, in, uh, in developing markets where the equipment uh, may just not be um, fit for purpose to manage um, some of the vehicles. And as we uh, learned earlier on this morning with the trend towards um, some of the bigger vehicles and the SUVs, um, it's really important. So I'll focus a little bit on uh, logistics quality auditing and, uh, and catastrophic loss planning. 
Uh, what is quality auditing? Well, for us, um, it's the assessment of processes against manufacturers' handling standards. Um, obviously, um, as I said a minute ago, really important that the manufacturers have got um, handling standards, and if they don't, the ECG ones will, uh, will work uh, in their stead. It's about the identification of, um, of suboptimum processes that are causing damage and additional cost and inefficiency by actually putting people on the ground to, um, to audit, to understand, to check, um, to train, to guide, um, to get people um, working in the most um, productive and uh, damage-free way. Uh, the word collaboration um, shines through um, the other um, presentations we've seen just now. Uh, and for me, uh, collaboration is one of the biggest points here. Very little point, um, uh, our company or the manufacturers um, producing edicts from on high saying, well, OK, this is how we want you to handle our cars and, that's, and, and just expect everything to happen. Uh, we, we all work in the, wor in the real world and we know that we need a little bit more uh, to get the right results out of people. And that can be through actually getting on the ground, understanding their issues, um, talking it through and then embedding um, the corrective actions as we go. So um, for us, um, collaboration is through the aud auditing side. It's also about the sharing of data um, with the logistics companies. So we're able to show them, OK, well, these are your problems and these are the things we, um, we need to work on. So for all of the LSPs in the room who have had um, our data given to them, who have attended our carrier forums, who have allowed us on their ships and on their trains and on, onto their compounds to, um, to audit them, I say thank you. Um, I think um, uh, overall um, there's been far more focus on damage and damage reduction activity um, since I first started coming to these conferences. Uh, my first presentation, um, similar uh, along the same lines to this, was in 2007. Um, where I put up some numbers in terms of what I felt the average damage rate in Europe was. And I was quoting sort of three and a half, four percent. Our clients are generally now in the one and a half, two percent um, range. Um, and that's come about you know, partly through some of the work that we've done. But actually, I think in terms of the attention that the LSPs have given to, um, to damage and quality and handling processes. And I think that's obviously all to the good. Still work to be done, of course. The other element um, to finish off um, is catastrophic loss planning. So um, we've, um, we've, the UK has had the wettest winter for something like 350 years. Um, we had uh, one uh, week in November last year uh, where I was in Germany looking after a storm claim. I had uh, two colleagues in Oman looking after a contamination claim. And I had another colleague in Sweden looking after a flooding storm claim. The week after that, we had a huge flood in the north of England in a big port, and we lost 70 vehicles to a, a, an inundation of water coming over the, um, coming over the locks. So we've seen um, cat loss as a, as a huge issue for, for, um, for manufacturers and for logistics companies, because you can have the most perfect um, vehicle handling guidelines, but at the end of the day, if stuff falls out of the sky that damages the car, or the water comes over the lock gates and floods the compound, then the best processes in the world will not help. What you need is a plan to respond to it quickly, to make sure the vehicles are repaired as quickly, as efficiently as possible, um, to get the vehicles back into the distribution chain as quickly as possible. So for us, um, the objective of the exercise is to have um, catastrophic loss plans, kind of break the glass in the event of flood or hail, um, which allow us to then um, implement the plan very quickly. So we're not spending time at the beginning of the incident thinking, right, OK, I've got 5,000 vehicles, they're all damaged, now what do we do? Um, there are companies um, like ourselves, as the, the Hale companies, of course, um, who are um, sponsoring and, um, and have stands outside, who are well, well practiced at managing these um, catastrophic loss events. So the competence is out there. Um, but for us, particularly um, my, uh, my adventures in, uh, in November, where we had um, issues in all these different places at the same time, um, told us that actually a lot of the manufacturers and the logistics companies who are supporting the manufacturers don't have a plan. Um, and so when it happens, it's start from the beginning that work it through, um, which is not necessarily the most efficient way of, uh, of managing the issue. So in conclusion, um, damages can be reduced through planning and collaboration. Um, we're seeing that. Um, the customer's experience, the end customer, who, who's uh, ordered his vehicle, wants it to arrive on time without damage. Um, the experience for that, uh, for that individual can be improved. And uh, in my humble opinion, uh, logistics can meet uh, the end customer's requirements of getting the vehicle there uh, on time, with good quality, and at lowest cost possible.
Thanks, everybody, for listening. Okay, Matt, thanks for that. Again, some, some really interesting perspective there. Uh, on the one hand, seeing the damage rates have seemed to have nearly halved in Europe. On the other hand, we have these catastrophic events which uh, seem to be happening more and more. And if Matt had had representatives in the US or in Asia, I'm sure we could have added to that list. Uh, I think there was disruption in Japan from snow and, and in the U across the US from, from winter, winter weather, so this, just this past quarter. So uh, certainly a lot, a lot of activity in that, in that way. Um, we're going to open up for Q&A, but before we do, I would like Richard Barker from Sovereign, I'd like you to just, would you like to say a couple of words to kick us off, uh, perhaps reflecting on some of the things we've just heard, uh, and, then, and then we can open up to the audience. Okay. Um, there's some interesting facts, really, I find come out of this type of meeting. Um, Matt, I think, is a really good comment, asking us who the actual customer is, and we very rarely talk about the end client and, and he's the one that determines where where the car's actually going to go so and that also influences us with how we actually treat a vehicle and one of the most important things is is the data the information that if we share between one another we could drive cost out the supply chain uh, quite considerably so and over the years we, we we tend to talk about these things but yet it still doesn't actually come forward that we actually make the change. A number of years, I think, John, that we've been talking about having a unified code, it, it doesn't actually happen. In actual fact, for an IT system to manage that, it's very simple for it to do, but we, we concentrate on things that a lot of other industries uh, have actually completed and dealt with and moved on from, and yet we don't seem to learn by those things. We have a very big and a great industry, but we don't we're not prepared to share. I think that is one of our biggest problems. Uh, we could help one another out. We could forewarn one another about things that are going on. And yet it, it isn't actually taking place. And it's the same theme throughout the whole of these conferences. I'd be interested to know how we could better work together in order to drive this forward. Uh, thanks, Richard. OK, um, I'd like to open it up to the floor or anyone amongst the questions. Oh, in fact, we have a question already here. Uh, Julian, up, up on the side here. This way. Uh. <laughs> Someone's got to teach him about direct logistics here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we have a very old team. They take the very slow movie. Thanks very much. Good morning, hi, Mark Morgan from Unicar. Um, there seems to be more interest from the LSPs than the OEMs for standardization, and indeed that's my experience from many years of, of being in this sector. With all the clear benefits that John clearly exposed there, why is there such reluctance still from the OEMs to engage in this, in this process, indeed create these standards, which as Richard quite rightly said, will bring huge benefits and most other industries are way ahead of, of this industry. Anyone want to tackle that one? <laughs> we need an OEM or two to reply. <laughs> Whenever, um, it's, it's like many things. Uh, people say, yes, collaboration, or yes, we would like to do something. When it comes down to actually applying resources, that, that could be one of the problems. Um, in the bad times, everybody's trying to cut costs and travel budgets. And other, other, the nice-to-haves are cut back. In the good times, companies are trying to get cars out the door as fast as they can and have, again, uh, another reason for not working together in a collective sense. So there's, there's probably never an ideal time and, and it, it affects companies in different ways. So Mark, I, I, I don't know the answers to all those questions, but um, I think it just needs somebody. I think, I think what it needs is, is a good business case, of course, and sometimes it's very difficult to put those together in an accurate fashion you know I just put a, a nominal couple of euros per car saving I mean it could be an awful lot more than that but we haven't had a chance to look into that in, in much more detail now if somebody at a senior level in a company is, uh, has something put in front of them and says uh, well you, you could save yourselves here a huge amount of time and money over the, the next year and, and years into the future they may well take much more notice and I, I know the practicalities of doing something can be very laborious um, 
but it may not be. Um, and without sitting around the table and talking about things and sharing some ideas, we're never going to know. We've had great success in many other areas, um, and we will have great success. Um, maybe just now is not the right time to do this sort of work in this particular context on the outbound side, but as I said, we'll, we'll keep the door open. Mike, do you want to add something? I think there's a, there's, a, there's a more fundamental answer to that, Mark, and that is that uh, if you take an individual OEM, they have a standard. As far as they're concerned, they're standardised. It's the LSPs who are having to deal with a number of different OEMs and therefore a number of different standards who are therefore made aware of the fact that there isn't standardisation, whereas an, an OEM is only dealing with their own particular set of standards. So they don't have the same visibility and, they, and it clearly then doesn't impact on them in a, on a day-to-day -day basis in the same way that it will with an LSP having to having to meet a number of different standards for a number of different customers. But interestingly, it, it, was, a, it was a vehicle manufacturer that came to us in the first place to, to raise the potential for it, because although, and Mike, it really does affect the, the end users so much more, but it, it affects the vehicle manufacturers as well, depending on the, the, the point in time. And if, if they are expanding the number of service providers, uh, the different markets are certainly will, will open up uh, new, new, uh, new contracts that have to be set up. So it does affect everybody uh, in the chain. Yeah, from, uh, sorry, just um, yeah. from... Yeah, hello. Oh, <coughs> sorry, I think Matt was just going to add to that and then we'll have your question. Just, yeah. yeah, sorry, just um, from, uh, from our side, we, uh, we have um, forums for, um, for our clients um, to come around and discuss um, damage and quality issues. And, and the first time we held the forum, um, we said to, uh, to the manufacturer clients, um, is um, outbound logistics an area of competitive advantage um, for, for you? Um, and with the exception of one uh, Japanese um, uh, manufacturer who, who very pointedly said, yes, it is, um, everybody else is, has come to those forums willing to discuss um, uh, quality and damage reduction initiatives, vehicle protection, uh, and so on in an open forum um, with, um, with like-minded peers, which for us has been unbelievably powerful. Um, so much so that the last time we had one of the meetings in our office um, in, uh, in the UK, um, we had um, people turning up with, um, with different sorts of um, wheel protection to show each other because they'd just launched it on, on one line and, and they were bringing in these, these blinking great sort of um, plastic um, sort of discs to, to bring in and, and, show, and show the rest of the, the rest of the people in the group. So collaboration can be done, um, and we think it's possible, um, as long as people are, are happy to engage and, and to share ideas. Question? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Christoph Wust. I'm from Ford. I may be uh, able to give you some answers here because it's important for us to have standards, uh, especially going Asia and so on. <clears throat> we clearly need standards for collaboration. My question is, so, when do we see global standards? For us, it's not interesting to have a European standard or an American standard. My question to the three of you, including the gentleman from AIG, is when do we see global vehicle standards? It's, it's a very, very good point you make. And, and we have been working with AIG on a lot of the inbound activities um, and a lot of, a lot of um, recommendations we've produced over the the last 15 years together, together with our Japanese colleagues in JAMA, the vehicle manufacturers. Uh, we call them the, the global standards um, and they're all available for, for everybody to, to, to access free. Um, these are things like uh, EDI, global EDI standards that, that now the currently the with GM and Ford and Chrysler have introduced, uh, Volvo, uh, Renault, PSA, and now I'm um, pleased to say that the, the, the German motor industry, the vehicle manufacturers, are in, implementing those for the impact. And these are, these are all the global standards we call the global, the global range produced by the Joint Automotive Industry Forum of AIG, ODET, and JAMA. So the body exists, and uh, yeah, it, it makes sense to do it. And wherever we get a chance, we, we talk with AIG or we talk with JAMA about any such collaboration activities. So yeah, we, the, what we find is, you need to start somewhere and get, get the views of a region. 
together, but very quickly you then need to share that with the other regions as well to, to, to come together to a, a, a true global standard. So it's possible. Anything else to add on that? Or I don't know if Bill from the AIG wanted to comment also on that since, since his question was partly addressed to him. Uh, Bill Carrigan from uh, AIAG, but getting back to what uh, Mike was talking about earlier is one of the reasons I'm over here this week, obviously, is to communicate more with ECG and we do with ODET on the inbound side, but to talk about doing something globally, not just a North American solution or a European solution, so that through things like EPOD and these quality handling manuals that we're producing, that we have something that we can share with the people in China, India, and all the developing emerging markets. So. Thanks, Bill. Any other questions from the audience there? Right from the side here? Is it Mike coming behind you the other side? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Halil. I work for DHL in-house consulting. Thank you very much for your presentations, gentlemen. Um, I understood that the focus of collaboration is mainly currently looked at from an IT perspective. So how can we improve data information exchange? Um, the first part of my question is how do you think, can we actually get there? What steps are required and where are the biggest gaps? And the second question is um, where other, what are other areas of collaboration that you see, for example, uh, if OEMs could collaborate to share supply chains to realize more consolidation potential or synergies, what are the other areas where we could collaborate? Okay. Uh, the steps to, to get to the small project we thought uh, we would be able to start would, would be quite simple. I mean, just we first of all need to have companies who are willing to sit around the table. But what we would plan to do, without going into too much detail, is first have, start off with a workshop bring together the companies that are interested to, to talk more. And just to bring everything out onto the table, we thought we would obviously start with a survey just to see what the, the landscape looks like. Bring people together, have a, have a good long session for a day, talking in some more depth about what could or could not be done. You can't do everything, and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's silly to try and do everything, as you know, with, with various projects in the past, I'm sure. Try and do something which is manageable, Try something out. If it works, then go on and do the next thing, uh, and maybe just expand the, the the area of the activity that you started. So, by sitting around, mapping, data modelling, looking at all the different informations exchanged, what are the formats? What are the descriptions? Are they the same with each manufacturer? Probably not. Trying to come to cons consensus, which is what it's all about at the end of the day, about standards, getting the people to agree and seeing the benefits, and then having got the, the, the data modeling set up very simply, and I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, an IT expert by any stretch of the imagination, but the next process would then be to standardize on the format of the data to be exchanged. So that you can basically, anybody then in the chain, uh, if they are using those standard messages and standard protocols will be able to get connected very quickly. I mean, a, a very simple analogy is, is a mobile phone. Uh, you may have a, uh, a Nokia, uh, somebody else may have a, a Samsung. You may be on one provider, they are another, but you can talk to each other. And that's the, the very simple analogy with the sort of principle that we're trying to achieve. Just having a common protocol that you can quickly exchange and quickly set up and communicate with. So that's how we would, that's how we start to go about it. The length of time depends upon what well, work involved, really, and the amount of time that people can uh, set up and uh, allocate to it. And what are the other opportunities out there? Well, that's something that could be explored. I mean, we can talk about the protocols, we talk about the messages, the formats for the exchange, um, and there are, other, there are other possibilities, I'm sure. Mike, you, you've got some of those. I mean, the yeah. EPOD, electronic proof of delivery, is another one. But it would have to, it would have to communicate with existing systems. And if you have a, an EPOD spec that doesn't communicate with any more than one manufacturer system, it's a waste of time. Okay. Um, so you need to have, again, a standard. And it needs to link in. It needs, it's, it's not to have it working in isolation. It needs to link right into the back office system 
of many different uh, operators in the supply chain then to make it work. A free flow of information. I mean, it's all very easy to say it, but that's the objective. Um, but it, it just requires a little bit of work, and it's not rocket science. On the inbound, we've been working on this for, well, 30 years, and uh, not that I've been involved in it for that length of time, but um, it, it's something which is much more complex on the inbound side with just-in-time, just-in-sequence deliveries. Um, and the application to the outbound side is relatively straightforward. The, the, the real problem is, is who do you collaborate with? Who holds the information? Who's allowed to see information? There's a lot of distrust throughout the industry, OEMs versus LSPs. But who do you actually collaborate with? And how, for how long? And how long do you set it up for? Um, in the insurance industry in the UK, they have a company called Exchanging, where they do continuously, they, they pass vast amount of information pertinent to the organisation they're passing it on to. There isn't such a thing in this industry, therefore we all try to do our own thing and keep the information that we have about a vehicle, about where it's going, to ourselves. And yet that is the most important thing that will drive out costs across the industry. And yet there is no portal for that, that collaboration to actually take place. The OEM can't do it because the LSP will be working for multiple uh, OEMs. Therefore, they won't put other information on an OEM system. So you really do need something like an exchanging in the middle of this industry to be able to disseminate the information. It will automatically set your standards for you that way because it can produce things that will allow that to actually happen. But somehow this word correlation will be here forever unless we actually start to do something about it. And uh, I think that is one of the biggest issues that we all have. I'm convinced it will drive not just tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions out of the supply chain. Thank you for that. Any other questions from the audience there? My name is Andreas reichel Kormann from Unica. I, Richard, I can only uh, support what you're saying. We have the same solution. We host all the data uh, captured during our inspection process in our own systems. We translate all the inspection uh, languages, I call it all the standards, from French, from German, from international manufacturers, from AIG, into our standard. And we feed them also into each different manufacturer, uh, OEM, LSP, uh, system and I can confirm there is not a single feed, EDI feed, what is similar to each other. Each new client will have a different feed. But what I would like to come back, Matt, is to the fact that you are saying uh, damages occur. And we see another element where damages occur and they just occur on the paper. When somebody is doing inspection uh, according to standard given by the manufacturer or given by the client, somebody else is doing a similar inspection but not according to standard. And this is a big issue where we need to overcome and we are doing everything what we can in order to support the industry and the uh, logistic in order to protect them against unjustified claims, unjustified damages. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's a, a really fair comment. Um, and, um, and the challenge, as always, is to create that harmonisation of inspection standards across the whole of the logistics chain. Um, of course, you can have an inspector in one port looking at the vehicle and saying, well, OK, that's really badly damaged and I'm going to mark that up. And then a, another surveyor in another port looking at the same vehicle and saying, well, OK, I'm going to pass it through. I'm not going to bother noting it. Um, the, um, none of those things, that inconsistency is, is of course, irrelevant unless the dealer picks it up. So it's managing the dealer is the, is the crucial element um, because what the dealer perceives as being a damage or a transit issue or a production issue um, is, um, is the key driver for the claim. Without that a first opinion, the claim doesn't happen. Um, we've got some of our uh, manufacturer clients actually represented in the room who have put an awful lot of effort into um, gating their um, vehicles leaving the factory um, so their processes are so tight that nothing leaves the factory with any kind of um, uh, warranty or production related issue. All the vehicles get turned around and, and, and repaired, where others, th those sorts of damages can, can release into the, um, into the distribution chain. 
polluting statistics, causing distrust, um, because the uh, LSPs are saying, well, okay, can we trust everything that the, the, um, the claims agent and the dealer is sending to us? So it's, it, I think it is about um, um, making sure that there is consistency and harmonisation across the board, mostly um, important at the dealerships, but actually really important at the, um, at the gate out um, uh, as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? We have one here. Um, beside the OEMs, is there any plan of cooperation with transport companies also to standardize the communication methods? At the moment, we, we are delivering information to our customers, but not, the material are not going directly to them. We always use logistics providers, and sometimes we have to translate the communication from three different ways, from what we are receiving from our suppliers, who we are delivering with a different tracking number, which the customer doesn't necessarily understand. It's, we have three different standards and they are not really integrated. Is, is there any specific try with uh, big companies like PHL or Agility, I don't know? As far as I know, not, and certainly not in the uh, realm. Um, from our point of view, we felt we start with the vehicle manufacturers uh, on, on this particular aspect because they're the ones who set, set the uh, requirements of their, their customers. So. Um, but there's no reason why we can't look at something else. I don't know, Mike, if that's something in your uh, area as well, looking at the LSPs and working with some of the standards or trying to do some standardization. That's sort of coming from the ground up a bit more, mm -hmm. is it? Well, I mean, ev ev everything that we look at is driven Principally by uh, by input from our members, so that, mm. you know, that's the LSP perspective. And it's not. I think one of the previous questions was: Is it just systems? Well, absolutely not, because a lot of what we look at standardising is is operational things as mm. well. So uh, uh, probably more so than systems, actually. Mm. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm. <laughs> OEMs are being asked what, what do they need, what is important for them. It's just that at the end we are still using too many systems and I just wanted to know if at the moment there are some logistic partners integrated to, to these platforms trying to, to get to the same way. Not that the standards move in one direction, forgetting other parts that are also integrated to, to the chain. Well, perhaps not, at least not yet. No, I, I, I'd like to say we could help, but maybe we can. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah. But uh, yeah. uh, it, it just requires coming together, and it's a sort of thing which can be done. And it's, it just requires that cooperation and, the, and a good business case. Yeah. Uh, changing track ever, ever so slightly, um, Mike mentioned EPOD, electronic proof of delivery, earlier, which AIG in North America is developing or has developed a standard for. Um, we just did an article on, on this, actually. So I don't know if it's just because we're starting to pay attention to it or, or if it's really, really starting to emerge as, as quite a trend now. I mean, we see in North America, Chrysler has mandated use of it across its, uh, its outbound supply chain, I think, by July this year. Is there any sort of equivalent in, in Europe right now. I, I'm kind of asking you, Mike, in a way, among your members, is EPOD something that, that is increasingly important uh, and being used more? Um, or is it, has it always been there? Or um, is, it, is it still sort of to come? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any requirements for it. Am I, am I functioning? Yeah. I'm not aware of any requirements for it as such. P if people do it on a, um, on a localized basis or on an individual basis, uh, LSP basis, but uh, I'm not aware of any uh, move like that to uh, to mandate it across areas or uh, by any of the OEMs. But, but yeah, I could I could well be wrong. Yeah. Maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's coming. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, that's that's one of the reasons we'll be talking to to yeah. uh, AIAG about what they've done on it to see if uh, you know we can be ready and uh, and utilise uh, some of the work they've done. Mm. And maybe Matt, I mean, part of the EPOD stuff isn't always just with delivery, is it? I mean, there's a lot of damage and claim stuff that can get involved in there. I mean, are you seeing this being used more now? No, 
No. No. And from a claims agent perspective, um, we'd, we'd welcome it. Yeah. And it would be great for immediate um, data capture. Um, it'd be great for immediate claims validation. You know, one of the, the big problems we have as a claims agent is um, the uh, the vehicle turns up, the uh, the dealer signs. Um, well, the dealer doesn't sign the paperwork. The driver goes away, and then the dealer signs the paperwork um, after the event. Yeah. The claim comes in. If the driver then takes a while to get back to his depot because he's he's overnight or he's away for a few days or there's an admin issue there, we can authorise a claim. Mm. Um, and then the dealer, the um, carrier comes back and says, well, I've got to clean the seat. And, and that the, the dealer fraud, basically, is um, it's rare, but when it happens, it's, a, it's, um, it's awkward to deal with and we have to make recoveries back from the dealership. So e-pods, from our perspective, would be, uh, would be great. Mm. Okay. Seems to be some signs that North America might be a bit ahead of the game here, um, so, but I wouldn't, be, wouldn't imagine that we might be too far behind. Uh, any other questions from the audience in the back there? Hi, Paul Sykes from Hertz. It's very interesting for me because as a, as a service consumer, but not an OEM, uh, we tend to follow with the technology that's developed out in the marketplace. You mentioned the, the uh, use of ePods. I believe Chrysler are working with um, Car Delivery Network. Do you see the emergence of agnostic platforms with associated device technology as a way of um, pushing this standardization? So it may not come from the OEM, it may not come from the uh, LSPs, rather it's going to come from providers of, of platforms. Yes, I could, I could, um, and that's, that's how some things start and, and then take hold. Yes, yes, it could happen, um, so easily. Um, and it's a question whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, and uh, if it's a good solution everybody's happy with, then fine. But. Um, it all depends on what that solution is, I suppose. <coughs> yeah. Just to, if anybody's interested in reading up a little bit more on some of those EPOD developments, in, including the Chrysler, there's an article on our website. Um, so if you just go to our website, you can find it. Um, we have another question from, from Bill in the back. Bill, you got next to you. Uh, just a comment on your question. Uh, what we just finished at AIAG was electronic proof of delivery. And we had over 50 member companies contribute to this standard. So it wasn't just the OEMs, it was the Holloway companies, it was Car Delivery Network, it was Cargotel, it was the people who designed these uh, uh, proof of delivery systems. And what we tried to get to was what we call a minimum standard. We were trying to tell the OEMs how to communicate with their LSPs. That's in their contracts, that's how they'll do those things but a minimum standard that everybody could agree upon, and that's what we were focusing on. And we'll have it rolled out hopefully by uh, middle of April. Yeah, thanks for that. Any other questions? Again, again, changing track a little bit, um, going back to some of the damage uh, stuff that Matt talked about earlier. We saw some of those, those figures that have come down, uh, and you, also, you talked about customers bringing in various types of protection. We, we just did an article again on on full covers, looking again at, at those trends. And I wonder, just from your perspective, what you're seeing out there, is, is there a move towards full covers again, or is it more targeted, or what sort of, what sort of material are you seeing emerge more often? Um, chain? To be honest, I think maybe uh, two years ago, my, my answer would be quite different to, to the answer I'm gonna give now. I think two years ago, I would have said, it's coming. Um, the, um, the price of um, the cost of fitting the vehicle protection is coming down. Um, the practicalities of actually arranging it um, uh, is getting easier, um, and, um, and, and this is coming. And there, and there are also um, the damage reduction um, benefits, but there's also a kind of a brand perception benefit as well. Um, one of our clients, um, premium um, manufacturer, did a, a very long and exhaustive study, and at the end of that process came to a decision that, yep, we were going to bag pretty much everything. Um, and we were, yep, okay, that's great. We started adjusting our own procedures and processes, making sure we understood, okay, how the vehicle inspection handover processes would work and so on. And two years on, um, sort of stuttering progress, um, not, quite, not quite rolled out in the way that they originally perceived. Um, and um, difficult um, necessarily to support a cost benefit analysis uh, based purely on damage and administration costs. So, um, 
yeah, kind of felt a couple of years ago that it was coming, and and now I'm I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there was a big step forward with um, <laughs> some, say, some of the German manufacturers maybe five years ago, um, but they've stopped at the level, they've stopped with the sorts of um, models that they're, that they're using um, the protection on, they're not going to go down the, to the smaller vehicles. It's, yeah, stuttering, I think. Mm, interesting. Um, any other questions or comments from the audience? Uh, unless anyone else from the panel would like to make a closing remark, I think, uh, I think we can probably end it there and, and break for lunch. Um, I'd like to, to thank them once again for a great discussion. We, we might have better named it the collaboration to serve the customer than just serving the customer, but, uh, but I think that, that was a lot of interesting points out of there. And um, please join us right next door for lunch. Thank you.